Hey guys, it's me, uh, Omar from the Horror Highway, and today we're going to be doing the Idaho Iceberg. I got this state from the suggestions of the Utah Iceberg comments. Animal Kelly 2987 mentioned Idaho and the Greater Idaho Movement, and I just started searching into that, and here we have the Idaho Iceberg. So, I hope you guys enjoy this iceberg, and uh, I would like to apologize. I don't know if I'm cursed or something. I, I almost like every time I work on one of these icebergs, I catch a cold or something. So for a couple of the entries, my voice is like was really strained, and I couldn't really, I couldn't really talk loudly, and I had to be right next to my mic. I don't think it's that much of an issue. It the sound changes completely, but the quality still remains decent. I would say. So again, I still apologize for that though, and uh, don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you're watching this video and you like it. Uh, come in which state I should do next, and yeah, thanks for watching. Tier 1 Bigfoot With having a total of 102 sightings according to the Bigfoot Research Organization, sightings of Bigfoot in Idaho reportedly go back all the way to at least 1887. It follows the same description as every other Bigfoot sighting, something big, dark, and shaggy. Also, it was bipedal. And a lot of the sightings in Idaho go along those lines with people driving down roads, seeing something in the woods, or just catching something off in the distance. Tall, shaggy, and ape-like. One of the more famous sightings was supposedly captured by a drone overhead of woods, in which some strange brown looking creature could be seen walking into the woods. Now if that's actually Bigfoot or someone in the suit, that's up to you to decide. Ghost Horses there's actually two different ghost horses, but I figured I'd just put them in the same entry. First is the Spectral Stallion of Owahi County. Now, the story goes that if you're ever lost in the wilds of Owahi and are looking around trying to find your way back, that if you look up into the sky, you'll supposedly see a white stallion in the sky, supposedly made of clouds, and that when it moves, it sounds like thunder, and that all you simply have to do is follow the horse back to safety. The other is the ghost horse of Dry Creek Cemetery. It's been said for a long time that around 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., the sound of hoofs could be heard around the cemetery. But the legend really took off when in 2019, a video of the ghost horse supposedly manifesting appeared on CCTV. Take a look, what do you think? Flat Idaho This isn't something people actually believe, it's more just kind of an inside joke from some r slash Idaho users. It's basically in response to the state government seeming to harbor a lot of crazy conspiracy theories according to a poster who has since deleted his account. It basically stems from a saying he heard where if you were to iron out all the hills and mountains in Idaho, it would be the size of Texas. So he just kind of said, hey, let's all just make up a fake conspiracy theory where Idaho's actually flat. And a bunch of people just kind of went with it. It's kind of like a little funny thing they did. Charlie, in Payette Lake, Idaho, they're said to live a sea serpent for it supposedly being seen in 1920 by workers who thought it was a log in the water but then saw that it began to move. More sightings would appear throughout the years and with these sightings people began to describe the sea serpent better, saying it had a dinosaur type head, pronounced jaws, humps like a camel, and a shell like skin. It wouldn't be until 1954 where people would decide on giving it the name Charlie. The reason it got the name Charlie was because there was a popular radio show hosted by a man named Jack Pearl. And in it, he had a catchphrase. Vast you dare, Charlie. Sightings continue to this day. Oregon County seceding. This is in reference to 12 counties from the eastern part of Oregon wanting to join the state of Idaho. In an article from the Washington State Standard by Matt Vazilla Ogambros. I'm sorry for butchering that. This topic is talked about. It is also known as the Greater Idaho Movement. The movement's been around for a while, but during the spring of 2020, the movement saw a lot of pickup and a lot of support from everyone because they felt as if the state government of Oregon wasn't doing enough for the residents in that part of the state. Now it seems that for the most part that this topic could be boiled down to that those who want to secede into Idaho from Oregon hold very traditionalist values and those who oppose seceding into Idaho are simply suggesting that those who live in Oregon just go move over there. They both have their reasons and, and if you want to learn more about it, I will link the article in the description of the video. As someone who doesn't live in Oregon or Idaho, I feel like it's best for me not to point the pros and cons of either side. 
since it seems to be a very focused and regional matter for those who live in the two states. Fishwoman of Lake Coeur d'Alene In the northernmost part of Idaho lies the Lake of Coeur d'Alene, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering that as well, my French is very bad. In an article found in the Spokesman Review by Susan English, it is read how Native Americans once believed the creature used to inhabit the lake. They were known as water mysteries, and this was how they were described. Unexplainable noises and a figure of a fishwoman have been reported near a large pointed rock here. A mysterious wind sometimes turns up the lake, and huge horned creatures is said to lift boats out the water. For that reason, it is believed that the lake is haunted by Indian maidens. Idaho does not exist. This is just another one of those silly little conspiracy theories. It also started on Reddit. I'm pretty sure no one's taking it seriously. It's also kind of just a little joke within the r slash Idaho and Idaho does not exist Twitter. The idea being that Idaho is so barren and you hardly ever meet anyone from Idaho that it's not actually a real place but sort of like I guess a marketing gimmick for potatoes or something like that basically. No real ideas conveyed in the Reddit post. It's more obviously meant to be silly and just poke fun. The state for I guess not being well known for a lot besides potatoes and being the birthplace of Ernest Hemingway. Seven Devils Mountain Range Originating from a Ne Percy legend about seven giants, it is said that these giants or beasts were devouring Ne Percy children. The Ne Percy people sought the help of a man called Coyote. This wise man would make a trap for the seven beasts slash giants in which he dug seven massive holes and filled it with magma and then would trick the beasts slash giants into running into the holes then covering them up and this is the creation myth for the seven devils mountain. It is also said that in order to prevent more of these things coming and attacking the Ne Perse, Coyote hit the ground with his cane and created the Snake River. The Twin Falls Saucer Hoax Shortly after the 1947 UFO flap in Idaho, there would be another sighting in Idaho on July 11, 1947, at least allegedly. Happening in Twin Falls, people from that town would claim to have recovered a 30-inch disc that came from the UFOs or was part of a UFO. Supposedly, the people who found this disc heard it fall at around 2.30 a.m. They didn't know what it was though. Then, the next morning at 8.20 is when it was found at the yard of someone's home. After it was reported, it was given to the police. And after it was given to the police, it was given to the FBI and the army. And once handed to them, they quickly dismissed it as a hoax. And then, on July 12th, four teenagers would actually come out and say that they had created the disc and that it was all a hoax. Assumedly, the teenagers were probably just looking to scare the neighbors and make a funny prank and happen to use a UFO flap to really spice up their prank, though I doubt they really expected it to go that far. Jellyfish in Idaho yeah, surprisingly, there are jellyfish in Idaho. At first, it was kind of seen as like a myth, but then in 1997, an article from Desert News would tell a story about a Girl Scout troop taking a scuba dive lesson at Quinn's Pond. There, they would see the jellyfish. Surprisingly, the jellyfish they found in Quinn's Pond was a man of war. Though, believe it or not, that's not the only spot where you could find jellyfish. There are also sightings at Eagle Island State Park. Paddler Another lake monster in Idaho, this one in Lake Pendorel, supposedly first being seen in 1944, though no one knows if this was actually the paddler or the navy testing secret submarines in the lake. But later in the 70s, more sightings would appear. In 1977, a young girl would see the strange creature, and when journalists reported the sighting, this is where it got the name the paddler, more specifically the Pendorel paddler. A search was conducted in 1984 by North Idaho College professor James R. McLeod. The search was called CryptoQuest 84. While the search found a lot of anecdotal evidence, nothing concrete was found. More sightings would continue, another one in 1985, and supposedly in 2007, a picture of the paddler was taken. The Vanishing Hitchhiker of I-95 Now, not a lot of information is known about this paranormal entity, but what is there seems to follow the trope of the white lady, a sort of spectral white ghost that you can stop and offer a ride to. One of the more famous stories about this entity is one from the 1970s about a woman named Laura, obviously driving down the I-95. She sees this lady in white and decides to give her a ride. Then the lady responds that she wants to be taken to Bonner's Ferry. On the ride to Bonner's Ferry, the lady would remain silent despite Laura asking questions. And when they finally get to the destination, the hitchhiker is gone. Tier 2 Wendigos There's multiple sightings of Wendigos around Idaho. I'll go through the ones I found. First was one that supposedly haunts the Sawtooth Mountains. 
Oh, and if you don't know what a Wendigo is, it's an Algonquin legend of a spirit possessing a human and it basically turns them into a cannibal. Or sometimes it's said that a human eating a human turns them into a Wendigo. Anyways, in the Sawtooth Mountains, it is said that a tall and skinny pale humanoid-like figure with antlers and glowing eyes haunts the mountain, causing all kinds of noises and scaring people off. And there's also a couple of Reddit stories. One I found was of a person who claims they saw a Wendigo in northern Idaho. I'll link that one down, so if you want to read it. I'll link all these down, so yeah. But basically, the TLDR on the Reddit story, if you don't want to read it, is basically this guy went out into the woods on his four-wheeler. And while he was out, he suddenly had a very strange feeling and didn't feel good. And that's when he noticed in this 10-foot bush, he saw these two yellow glowing eyes about 8 feet high into the bush. And he got a very bad feeling and ran away. Went back and did some research and noticed that no animal fit the description. Like, there was nothing there that would stand at 8 feet. Tallest thing was a bear, which would only stand at 6 feet tall within that area. The Hill People On a reddit thread asking for the strangest conspiracy theories for Idaho, user Pearl Potatoes would talk about the Hill People, which are sort of a disenfranchised off the grid group of people who live off the land only and make very little contact with others. User Pearl Potatoes goes on to describe them like the people from the hills have eyes. Then Pearl Potatoes goes on to describe a third hand account she heard, one of a forest service worker driving into a chain of people in the middle of a road because they were trying to ambush him. When the forest service worker went to the police to confess his crime for running over people, the police had no reports of the crime and so it was never investigated on. Idaho Chinese Tunnels Called the Chinese Tunnels because the rumored tunnels were in areas where a large portion of Chinese people used to live in Idaho. They were first thought to be nothing but rumors. But soon a video would come out showing that these tunnels did actually exist. In July 2021, in an article by Maria L. La Ganga on the Idaho Statesman, it was revealed that within the Idaho State Archives, there's actually 15 minute black and white video footage of the Chinese tunnels, though it is believed that most are destroyed and inaccessible now. The Bogus Basin Trolls a superstition among skiers and snowboarders in Boise, Idaho, near Bogus Basin, an old tale of snow snakes would evolve into the Bogus Basin Trolls, which is basically a superstition for the skiers and snowboarders. The superstition goes that you're supposed to open your doors and let the trolls in, and as you make your way up the mountain to ski or snowboard, you open the door again to let the trolls out. Doing so will give you good luck and make sure that the trails are nice and safe. Supposedly, on your way up to the mountain, you come across an acoustic cattle grate, that's where you open the door to let them in. And then when you finally make it all the way up to the lodge, you open the door to let them back out. Curse of the Idaho Potato Farmer Idaho is known for its potatoes, but supposedly in the 1870s, there was a curse happening to many potato farmers in the area, who were farming a potato known as an early rose potato. As many would plant crops, and overnight they would seem to decay, many farmers almost immediately suspected foul play, and so they stayed up all night watching their plants grow, and that's when they saw something rather strange, a hooded figure with eyes that glowed red. The legend goes that the farmer who saw this figure died shortly after. Many farmers believed this hooded figure to be the spirit of a Native American chief who had been displaced by the farmers, and so those who farmed on the land were cursed. The Cannibal Dwarves of the Idaho Mountains According to native legend, the Nirmergar, aka the Cannibal Dwarves, are something that have existed for a long time and were constantly pestering and trying to attack the natives there. Though they are dwarves, the real threat came from the fact that they were able to use magic powers, said to have superhuman speed, the ability to turn invisible, and run extremely fast. Another thing they were supposedly able to do was to shoot arrows as long as 10 men and as thick as a man's body. The reason they attacked the tribes was because they were hungry and they used to eat the people. So if you're ever in the Idaho mountains, watch out for those 2-3 to three feet dwarves. The Bruno Dune State Park Halo During June 2022, in the skies of the Bruno State Park, a very strange phenomena would occur. Many attribute it to a UAP slash UFO phenomena, as of course, ever since after 2020, there has been a massive uptick in the sightings and reports of UFO slash UAP phenomena in Idaho. Pictures would be taken of a strange light and above that light, a weird halo. It was reported that shortly after midnight, this strange light and halo would slowly dissipate and move towards the east. And after that, it was completely gone. No one knows what it is. 
Some think it might have been a wormhole for a UFO slash UAP. General Idaho UFO Information This info comes from SatelliteInternet.com and it ranks Idaho as number 10 in UFO sightings with 68 people for every 100,000 claiming to have seen a UFO. And something interesting to add is supposedly by satellite internet in 2020, Idaho was actually the number one for UFO sightings, with the National UFO Reporting Center having 1,348 reports currently as of this recording. The Swan Valley Monster It would be on August 22, 1868, when people saw something strange poking its head out of the water, or I should say trunk, because people saw some elephant trunk rising out of the water. And shortly following that, they saw a head, a snake-like head coming out of the water as well. They noticed on the head was a single horn and very long black whiskers on both sides of the face. With fangs for teeth and a red forked tongue, it seemed to be spewing green poison. Finally, it came out of the water and the legend goes that the person who saw this saw a very strange creature. One with 12 legs, a fish-like body, a crocodile-like tail and very strange color complexion of green and yellow with red and black spots. The man's reaction to this monster was very reasonable. It was to shoot it, and so he did, and he would shoot it again. The reason we know that it was spitting poison is because supposedly, whatever it was spitting was killing whatever it touched. The man who could not carry it back by himself went back into town and came with six other men to try to bring it into town, but by the time they got there, it was gone, and where it was laying, the vegetation was dead. Lake Pendorel While UFO sightings around Lake Pendorel aren't strange and out of the ordinary, in fact, the creator of a book called 78 Years of UFOs, Dale Snipes, has a page on the internet where it says she's witnessed many UFOs off her porch on Lake Pendorel. That isn't what's actually the focus of this entry, but rather the secret military base at Lake Pendorel. Compared to Nevada's Area 51, there's actually a United States Navy Acoustic Research Detachment Center there, and one of the things that they test is submarines in the lake. Now, with all the testing they do in the lake regarding submarines and the strange phenomena occurring above the lake, some might theorize that the two are connected and that in fact, maybe USOs are involved, unidentified submersible objects. But who knows? In the end, the military just tells the public that all they do is test the submarine stealth capabilities at this center. Tier 3 The Water Babies of Massacre Rocks In the Massacre Rocks State Park, along the Oregon Trail, there is a river known as Snake River that is known for its paranormal activity. The activity supposedly stems from drowned babies known as water babies. The story behind the drowned babies goes as this, during the 1800s, while the Native Americans still roamed the land, there was times of heavy famine and food shortages. So, to not let the baby suffer, they would take it out the Snake River and drown them there. Supposedly, this also happened to some white settlers during the 1800s. The legend continues that once the babies had been drowned, they would change. They would become more fish-like and be able to breathe in the water and eat the small fish that lived in the river. And obviously the legend persists as people claim to have seen the water babies still living in the river, trying to avenge their own deaths by killing randoms who come across them. Chris Bell, 2000 UFO Sighting On September 27, 2000, Chris Bells and two others would be camping in Chalice, Idaho. After a day of hunting, they would retire in their camper RV late in the night. For whatever reason, Chris decided to step out while the other two decided to stay inside the RV. While outside, he hears a strange noise and starts looking around. That's when he looks up. He notices a strange triangular object. He then goes for a flashlight and shines it upon the object. That's when he notices the size. Estimating that to be about 300 feet long, he sees a rounded, triangular UFO. And shortly after that, the object would light up and fly away before he could call out the others to show them. Idaho 2023 UFO sightings. Now I don't really want to call this a flap because I don't think it's enough sightings to call it a flap but there were three videos about UFOs in Idaho posted in 2023. One is the twin fall lights which basically just shows some sort of flying object with a lot of lights. Some people believe it to be a plane. Most people don't think it's a plane so by definition it's a UFO. The other was the UFO over North Idaho, which shows kind of like a line of lights with a little space in between those lights. 
flying in the night sky obviously a ufo because it doesn't look like any type of plane or anything the other was this pulsating ufo which was just a really bright flying object in the night sky they were all posted in 2023 if you're watching the video you'll be seeing them and if you're from idaho i'd like to know your thoughts about what you think these things are 1947 flying saucer now personally i would give this to washington and i probably will give this again to washington when we do the washington iceberg but whenever you search up utah ufo one of the most famous things that constantly pop up besides the rampant sightings during 2020 is that the first person to coin the term of flying saucer is a man from utah that man was kenneth arnold on march 24th 1947 over mount rayner on his way back to Boise, Kenneth Arnold would see nine flying objects. Though what happened a month later definitely happened in Idaho. And that was a UFO flap. Beginning on July 1st, 1947, two forest rangers in Twin Fall, Idaho would report seeing eight to ten shining disc-like objects in a V formation. Then, the next day, July 2nd, over in Malta, Idaho, another report, this time from a married couple, supposedly they saw a flying saucer about the size of a moon, but it shined brighter. And then on July 3rd, another report, this time from seven railroad workers, who said they saw nine silver colored objects flying in yet again another V formation. Then we jump five days later on July 8th in Magic Valley, an additional 16 reported sightings were made from several witnesses in Twin Falls. Though with these sightings, what people saw wasn't really agreed upon. Some believed they were flying discs. Others believed that they'd be bats. 1967 Idaho Falls Sighting On December 8th, around 7.40 p.m., a 15-year-old Marilyn Wildling would be outside in her yard when she witnessed something in the sky, a luminous and hovering object that was about as big as a car, obviously being mesmerized by what she saw. She kept staring. And that's when she noticed that it would tip and rotate and with that she noticed that the top was actually a dome that was transparent and from there she could see two figures though the light the object was producing did not let her get a good look soon after she would run into her house trying to get others to come look at the object but no one else did so she just went back out to stare at it and managed to catch it rotate in a clockwise direction while keeping its altitude afterwards it would just disappear. Apparently the object was only 50 to 100 feet from the ground above them and only 100 yards away. Reary, Idaho, 1967 sighting. November 2nd, 1967, around 9.30 p.m. Just outside of Reary, Idaho along Highway 26, a blinding flashlight would appear in front of two young men and their car which showed up after that it was a transparent dome that seemed to have two people in it. For whatever reason, the young men's car would be brought to a stop, despite them making no effort to do so. This transparent UFO was about 8 feet wide and flashed green and orange lights around the rim. After that, one of the occupants from the ship would come out, slowly floating down, and make their way to the two young men's car. Both men would call it going to the driver's side door and getting behind the wheel, and describing that the car seemed to be towed by the UFO but they don't know if that was the case or if it was actually being driven. From there, they were led to a field where the UFO floated above them. As the car remained still, one of the men took this opportunity to run away and would claim to be chased by a blinding light. Meanwhile, the other stayed in the car out of fear. Supposedly, the being spoke to that man, but he did not understand what the man was saying. He would describe the sounds coming out of the being to those like a bird. And that's apparently when the second being showed up and essentially told the first one it's time to go and they both left. This all apparently happened in about 15 minutes and the two men would eventually go and report this to the deputies themselves but not before going to a local for help because after that whole experience they were extremely terrified. An investigation by the state police did actually begin and local farmers reported lights in the area. 1947 Snake River Canyon Siding on August 13th, a farmer and his two sons would see what's described as a flying saucer quickly skimming through the Snake River Canyon at insane speeds. It would seem as if the farmer's boys were out on the river on a boat and the farmer decided to check up on his kids. He was on his way to the river 
when he saw the flying saucer at around 1 p.m., claiming it to be about 75 feet from the canyon floor and going approximately 100 miles per hour. While they did get a good look at the object, it wasn't there for long, and by the time it had left, they were trying their best to remember what it looked like so they could draw it. He would describe the way the object flew as if it were riding up and down over the hills and hollows at a speed indicating some type of control faster than the reflexes of man. He would also describe that it made very little noise, that it looked like an inverted pie plate or a broad brimmed straw hat and was about 20 feet long, 10 feet high, and 10 feet wide, with an oblong shape. Bring Ridge Creek Mining UFO Happening somewhere in the mid-60s, the person who told the story no longer remembers the exact year, but they do remember what happened. That was him and his friend went camping in the Spring Creek area. They were avid hunters, so they woke up at 6 a.m., and that's when they noticed a shiny spot of ore on the Spring Creek mine across the valley. Upon focusing on that shiny thing, they realized there were actually four of those things. And on those four things, there were four strange arms coming out of them, seemingly picking at this pile of rock, picking it up and putting it inside the ship. They saw all of this through the scope of their hunting rifles. Then they noticed these objects flying up, going to a mothership of sorts, much larger than the rest. This one was cigar shaped while the others were UFO shaped. They noted that the ones mining seem to have a transparent cover. They don't exactly remember when this happened, but they assume it was for about 45 minutes, and they remembered the objects making four trips to the mothership. After the objects seemed to complete what the men assumed was their mining task, they went with the mothership and vanished. Tier 4 The Idaho Hotel in Silver City Established in 1863, this hotel in Silver City, which was once a very busy mining town, is said to house many strange paranormal things, such as orbs and ghosts. Some of these ghosts is the big gentleman, which is a big guy who wears a tux. There's a lady in the white dress, known as Screaming Alice. There's the aforementioned orbs, and there's the shutting and opening of doors and moving of chairs. With over 150 years of history in this hotel, and now being in a ghost town, this hotel makes for a great spooky haunt to visit. The Lava Hot Springs Hotel Built in the 1930s, it was used as a sanatorium and rehabilitation center for soldiers of World War II. It is said that those who were being treated still haunt this hotel, specifically room 13, which was the anesthesia room. While the hotel was still a hospital, it is said that the ghost of a woman named Maria haunts that room. Other paranormal activity is apparitions and the sound of voices talking. During the 1980s, the sanatorium would be turned into a hotel, and that's what it remains till this day. The Oahe Plaza and Hotel Having been opened since 1910, this hotel has a lot of history behind it, and with that history comes many reports of supernatural encounters, though these are just encounters. Many of these encounters are described as full body apparitions or bad feelings and temperature drops. One of the more prominent encounters happened in room 136 when a hotel guest member woke up at night to the apparition of a woman standing in his room. And that wasn't the only time that had been reported in that room. It is said that once you enter the hotel, it feels like you're being watched. And many attribute that to the woman as in the multiple times she's appeared before people, all she does is watch them. The Spirits of Spirit Lake Also known as Temony by the locals which as far as I could find with the Kudane tribe, there's a local folktale by the tribe. The tale goes that an Indian princess was forced to marry a chief's son from a different tribe and forced to refuse the one she truly loved. This caused her and her real lover to jump off a high cliff into the lake. Supposedly they landed in the water and vanished within its murky depths. Though some dispute the tale as many would assume you would just land on the rocks around the lake, not the actual lake itself. Though there is another tale, this one not by the natives, but by one of the first settlers there, Pete Roadback, as he explained to a New York journalist, John R. Revis, in the Spokane Falls, it is a story of seven men crossing the lake in a canoe, when suddenly, they're swallowed up by the lake and never seen again. The story goes that it was an evil spirit that swallowed them up, and for that reason, the natives never hunted in that lake ever again. The Idenho Building Hotel Built in the 1900s and opened since 1901, this hotel has a lot of history and with that, many supposed paranormal experiences. 
One of the most famous is the Bellman's Ghost, which is a ghost that supposedly haunts the elevator and is said to watch you around corners of the building. Other reports are moaning sounds and misty gray apparitions appearing. There's even a report of a woman who died in the hotel's basement. As she was a murder victim, it's said that her spirit still haunts the basement and most lower levels of the building. If you go online, you'll see many reports of people feeling uneasy and a heavy presence in the hotel. Ender's Hotel Built in 1917, it originally wasn't a hotel, but sort of a town center. The bottom acted as a mall, while the second story acted as a ballroom. But slowly over time that would change, and the second floor would be renovated. Soon, the second floor would house the hotel part of the building, and slowly, that overtook the whole building. While no one knows when the manifestations of paranormal activity started, it goes without saying that since being built in the 1917, there's gonna be some ghosts. One of the more popular legends is of a man who was shot and killed within the building. Another talks about a man who fell down the stairs. More importantly, on the second floor, there's a museum that holds many personal items from different people's past. Some say that with these items, they carry ghosts and different paranormal entities. Like many of the other buildings on this list, you're likely to feel watched within this building or maybe even see an apparition if you're lucky. Either way, with all the history in that building, there's bound to be something. The Jameson Saloon and Inn Built in 1892, this very historic building has some famous paranormal entities living within it. One is a spirit named Maggie, which actually makes physical contact with those who encounter it. This one is said to be friendly. The other is a man called Ollie, who's known to be a prankster. The other one has not been identified. There have been reports of poltergeist-like activity. Many believe this to be Ollie playing pranks. Some of the mischievous things he has supposedly done is turn lights on and off, throw stuff, spray perfume, make sounds, and move within shadows. The Idaho State Penitentiary Built in 1870 by the prisoners who would occupy it, it is now said to be haunted, most famously by the ghost of Raymond Snowden, who was Idaho's Jack the Ripper. Over time, the prison would come to hold over 13,000 convicts, with a supposed 110 dying within the penitentiary and holding 10 state executions within the building. Due to the very poor conditions of the prison and the fact that it was not meant to hold as many people as it always did, many riots would break out. The reason I mentioned Snowden earlier is because supposedly he's the most active ghost in the penitentiary and many claim to have seen slash heard him in the building. The Egyptian Theater First opening in 1927, just like many of the other buildings on this list, it's had a long history Besides just being described as kind of eerie and unnerving, it is also said to be haunted by a ghost of a man named Joe, a projectionist who worked in the theater during the 1920s and died of a heart attack in the building. It's said that he turns the lights on and off and makes strange sounds and opens and closes doors. The Hoff Building Time Slips Built in the 1930s and originally known as the Hotel Boise, this building has a lot of history in it, and with that, comes all sorts of paranormal activity, many tales of it being haunted, but one of the more interesting phenomena that appears is the time slips, which is when people feel like they're sent back in time. Supposedly, there has been multiple people who have gone through time slip phenomena in the Hoff building. They seem to say that the building changes, that it looks more like something from the past than what it currently looked like. Tier 5 The White Horse Saloon Opening in 1908 and having remained a restaurant and saloon ever since its opening, it's one of the historic sites of Idaho that you should definitely go check out. It was even registered as a historic place in 1979. Again, like I said multiple times in this video, its long history attributes it with a lot of paranormal activity. One of the more famous ghosts, Big Girl, Big Girl is said to be drawn to room 2 of the hotel. The White Horse has 8 rooms available. No one knows for sure who Big Girl is. But the most accepted legend was that it was a hotel maid whose son died crossing the street to the hotel, and that's what binds her spirit to the hotel. Though that's not the only paranormal encounter people have had in the hotel. There have been reported flying dishes, slamming doors, footsteps, and apparitions, and voices echoing in the hallways. Far Gut State Park This camping site used to be a military jail building and former naval training center. People who have camped there before claim to have seen ghosts and other paranormal entities there, specifically in the old military jail building. That's where the site of most paranormal activity happens, with sounds with no known sources being heard and things within the cells moving on their own. The Strange Love Nightclub 
built in 1906, this building has been many things. A gym, a restaurant, a church, a strip club, and most recently, a nightclub. Supposedly, one of the ghosts that haunts the nightclub is an actress that was killed by a janitor. Via instruction of the actor's understudy to take her lead role, it is said that she appears in people's photos in the background, as well as moving carts and bottles. They say where you're most likely to see her is in the elevator shaft. State Hospital South Cemetery Located right next to Idaho's oldest mental institution, which was built four years before Idaho became a state on July 2nd, 1886, the cemetery would see over a thousand graves and has been around for over 130 years. Being right next to the mental institution, it is said that many of those who have died in the building hunt the cemetery as well as those buried in the cemetery, and many of those that died in the building would be given unmarked graves on that cemetery. There have been reports of full body apparitions, partial apparitions, ghost orbs, and just a heavy and eerie presence as well as of course feeling like you're being watched. Idaho's Devil Gate aka the Massacre Rocks Created by the Sweetwater River, it's a canyon 50 feet wide, 1,500 feet long, and 370 feet deep, getting its name for being both beautiful and eerie. Legend has it that the devil himself made it. Others say the gate itself is actually two giant stone sentinels guarding the canyon. Some native legends about the Shoshone and Bannock talk of a powerful demon named Big Star who fell in love with a human woman. He wasn't able to court her and in his anger he carved out the canyon to show his wrath. Either way this landmark has always given people a bad vibe and that's one of the many reasons to go visit it. Old Roberts Hotel Built in 1892 and originally named the Patry Hotel. It is one of the oldest standing buildings in southeastern Idaho. Supposedly, 15 different spirits haunt the hotel. One of the more astonishing claims is that an entire family haunts the hotel. Some of the other ghosts include a child who is playing, an Asian man who is said to have worked in the hotel while he was still living, a soldier, and a woman in a green dress. Some of the paranormal activities some people have experienced is their bags being unpacked strange sounds, and feeling watched. One of the more wild legends about this place happens to be about the Asian ghost. It's said that he was the victim of a murder. He was killed, thrown inside a trunk, and then thrown onto a train. Some say you could hear the trunk going down the stairs at night. Tier 6 The Cour d'Alene Confrontation of 1899 this all starts with the Bunker Hill Mining Company who ended up hiring Pinkerton spies to hide among their employees to identify union members so they could then fire them. And so that did end up happening, firing 17 union members, this would not make the miners happy. And then on April 29th, 250 union members would take control of a train, drive it all the way to the city where the Bunker Hill Mining Company was at, and dynamited the Bunker Hill Mine. This would end up killing two miners, one a union member and the other wasn't. This would cause Idaho's governor to get in contact with the president, who he urged to send in the U.S. Army, which the president did, which led to 1,000 men being imprisoned in an old barn where three people would die from how bad the conditions were. As all these men were imprisoned, the conflict would simply fizzle out, and eventually some would even be let go with no charges at all, while others would end up being prosecuted. Sunshine Mine Disaster, 1972 on May 2nd, 1972, a fire would break out in the Sunshine Mine. As this fire broke out, smoke would end up engulfing the inside of the entire mine, causing carbon monoxide levels to raise through the roof. In total, there were 173 miners in the mine at the time. 80 would manage to escape, while 91 would die to carbon monoxide exposure. Rescue efforts would not be all that successful, as they had no way of locating where the fire originated from, but they would manage to rescue two people a week after the fire started. These two survived by running deeper into the mine. By the time the rescuers found them, they were 1,600 meters underground. The Plague, 1985 Now, this isn't in reference to some sort of outbreak of disease, but rather a literal plague of grasshoppers that caused 6 million acres of severe crop damage. Damages were so bad in four counties that they had to be classified as disaster areas, and damages would total over a million dollars for the first year of the attack. A report from the Chicago Tribune from 1985 would write that they were receiving reports of 1,800 insects for every square yard. 
This destruction of the crops was made worse by the fact that the state was going through a drought. So now what little the state could produce was now destroyed. The Snake War This was a war between the United States settlers and Indians who lived along the Snake River. They would be called the Snake Indians even though that's not what they were. That's just what they were called. These natives were from Northern Paiute, Bannock, and the Western Shoshone Bands. The reason for the fighting was because as more and more American settlers pushed on native land, the natives felt that they needed to defend. And this culminated on several attacks during the 1850s from natives on lands where people were settling. You had them attacking forts, wagons, trains, and what kept raising the tensions between the natives and the settlers was that more and more settlers just kept coming. And as the promise of gold started appearing along the west side of the United States, this just caused more and more settlers to settle upon the land that wasn't theirs. This all leads to January 29th, 1863, the Bear River Massacre. I'll TLDR here because I go into it later in the iceberg. Basically some Union Volunteer soldiers attacked a Shoshone village, killing a lot of people. The Snake War lasted for four years, 1864 to 1868, and it was a lot of very small battles. It wasn't one big battle. Really, the biggest was the Battle of Owahi River, which happened in 1866 which was really when some US troops found some Paiute people just sleeping and they kind of got into a swift battle. In the end, 30 natives would be killed and 7 would be captured and the US army would only lose one person. That was kind of the biggest battle of the Snake War. In the end, the natives kind of had no choice but to just have peace with the settlers coming in and the war would just kind of fizzle out in 1868. Though that being said, while it was a lot of little battles, there was still a lot of loss of life. In the end, a total of 1,762 men were known to have been killed, wounded, and captured by both sides. The Bannock War In 1869, the Fort Hall Reservation would be made in Idaho, meant to hold 600 Bannock Indians and some Shoshone. The government didn't give enough land and food for the people to survive there. This caused tensions to rise between settlers and the natives, and multiple times the natives would attack and kill white people. But what really set them off was when one day, on the farmland for them, they went to go harvest some commas root. What they ended up finding was white settlers using their plants as feed for their animals. Now immediately the government knew that the settlers were in the wrong. And so what did they do to try to appease the natives? Who they forcefully moved from their land and, and try to set some land for them but repeatedly failed to protect that land for them? Nothing. They simply wished that they wouldn't join an attacking force. And multiple times they promised they wouldn't. But at a certain point enough is enough and starvation leads people to desperate actions. So the Bannock would join with the Northern Paiute with around 200 warriors and would end up raiding white settlements for food. The government would set General Otis Howard on a campaign to stop these raids. And by August he would end up capturing 1000 Bannock people. And the fighting would eventually end by September 5th, 1878. The reason for the fighting coming to an end was just defeat. There was really no way the natives could win. And on that September 1878 I mentioned, 20 Bannock lodges would end up being attacked by the army. They would end up losing 140 Bannock men, women, and children. They just kinda had to give up and go back to the reservation. Battle of Pierre's Hole It's actually called Tenton Basin now. On July 17th, a lot of trappers and some natives that were friendly with those trappers were going to a rendezvous with the loot they had from their halls and stuff. It was about 150 of them. They were in Blackfoot country with, which was a tribe of natives to the settlers and other natives to the land. Basically the Blackfoots would initiate the attack but upon realizing they were running into 150 people, they very quickly changed the flag they were holding which was a British one that they took from a different group of people that they attacked into like a surrender flag as they tried to find peace with the 150 people they rushed into a fight with. Now the traders did go out to meet them, and as they were shaking hands with the Blackfoot chief, the traders actually ended up attacking first, killing the Blackfoot's chief, mainly because the traders didn't believe the Blackfoot actually wanted peace, because they were known on backing out of deals and like backstabbing people, and also some of the natives who were with the traders were part of those tribes that the Blackfoots had alienated by attacking and just being aggressive with. This immediately resulted with the Blackfoots scurrying away and trying to hunker down in the woods. Meanwhile, a group of the traders and some natives got together, I, was, I believe it was about 30 whites and 30 natives, so like in total 60 people. They would give chase to the Blackfoots, but by the time they kinda got to anywhere near where the Blackfoot people were, 
they had like this fortified area that they were hunkering down in and the traders couldn't really get in. They obviously had more people than the Blackfoots, but the Blackfoots were just in a more advantageous position to where the traders couldn't get in. So they were all just kind of taking pot shots at each other, trying to find ways to get in and attack. Meanwhile, the Blackfoots just made sure to keep them out. A native who knew the Blackfoot language was communicating with the Blackfoots, and basically what he ended up finding out was that the Blackfoots there were kind of in a way in recon team. It was to send 600 to 800 Blackfoot warriors to attack the rendezvous the traders were going to. This caused a majority of the traders go and check on the rendezvous area to make sure that wasn't true. Meanwhile, while this was happening, other traders had come together to basically like burn down where the Blackfoot people were hunkered down in. But by saying that they were going to go attack the rendezvous, it ended up sending enough traders away that the Blackfoots actually managed to get out and basically escape with, as far as the traders could see, very little losses of life. On the traders' side, five white people would be killed and six white people were wounded. On the friendly native side, five would end up being killed and six were wounded. On the Blackfoot side, they would end up admitting that they had lost 26 warriors in the battle. Tier 7 The Beaver Creek Fire On August 7th, 2013, lightning would strike in Beaver Creek. This would quickly set the area ablaze. And just because of the strike of lightning, over 114,900 acres of land had been burned. And in the end, this fire would cost the state a total of $25 million. But fortunately, no one would lose their life. And by August 31st, the fire would be contained. 1976 Tenton Dam Collapse The story of the Tenton Dam begins on July 3rd, 1976. Only a couple of months after the dam has even been opened, workers find two small leaks on the dam. And then we move on to Saturday, June 5th. More leaks have been found since then. But this time, a really big one's been found, and it sprung. They also notice a wet spot on the right side of the dam, and when preparing to replace the material that was damaged, they notice it was much more than they could repair in time. And so, they have the alert of everyone of the incoming flood that's about to happen. By noon, a 15-foot high wall of water would hit the town of Wilford, Sugar City, Rexburg, Tenton, and St. Anthony. The first three saw serious damage. The bursting of the Tenton Dam would cause 11 people to die and over $2 billion of damages. The Tenton Dam would eventually be repaired, but it would never see use the way it was intended, rather at a very much reduced rate so the same thing doesn't happen again. Mount St. Helens Eruption 1980 Now I know what you're thinking, uh, why is this on the Idaho list? Surely this should be on the Washington list, and it will be, but the thing was, that this eruption was so big that it hit parts of northern Idaho. Now, if you look on the map, it would make sense for it to hit Washington and Oregon. It's like right next to each other. But Mount St. Helens is a pretty far way from Idaho. That being said, it hit the state so hard that on the state website for Idaho, the Mount St. Helens eruption is listed a major disaster. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens would erupt, obviously destroying a large area around it. The time of the eruption was 8.32 a.m., but by mid-afternoon, eastern Washington and northern Idaho were covered in darkness because of the thick ash clouds created by the eruption. Those dark clouds that covered Idaho were ash from the volcano. That ash would slowly make its way down onto the ground. The thing about volcanic ash is that it's actually composed of tiny sharps of shard glass and rock which means every time people breathe it in, it damages their lungs. So people were advised to wear face coverings and masks so that they wouldn't get hurt breathing in for the next several days that they would have to endure. Obviously, roads needed to be shut down. Planes, trains, any transportation was severely limited or you just did not have it at all. And people had to be careful when washing the ash out from the streets or anywhere. Because if you put too much ash down the drains, you'll end up clogging the whole system for Idaho, causing even more damage. And also, as everyone was trying to clean up the ash, that caused a water shortage. So bans on water use had to be enacted by the state. Though, in the end, people from Idaho would come together and do their best to clean everything up as much as they could. But it did end up costing the state tens of millions of dollars. The Great Fire of 1910, also known as the Big Blowoff, Big Burn, and the Devil's Broom Fire. On August 20th, 1910, a strong hurricane-force wind would bring a bunch of small fires together 
turning it into this big burn. The reason there were so many small fires was because the winter was extremely dry and now the summer was extremely warm. This fire wasn't just localized in Idaho. It actually reached Montana and Washington and a bit of Canada too. In total, the fire burned 3 million acres around the size of Connecticut and in the end would unfortunately see the loss of 87 lives, 78 of those being firefighters. Many of them lost their lives trying to save others from the fire. This fire would have caused an estimated $1 million in damages at the time, which in 2023 money was $31,490,000. And in the end, what actually stopped this fire was a cold front sweeping in, bringing in rain and snowfall. Emmett, Idaho fallout. Though this entry is called Emmett, Idaho fallout, there were actually more counties affected from the Nevada test sites that hit Idaho. Some of these counties were Limai, Blaine, Cluster, and Gem County. And this is exactly what you think it is. When bombs were being tested in Nevada, the fallout hit Idaho. This was around the 50s and 60s. In an article from the New York Times called Suffering the Effects of a 50s A-Bomb Test by Sarah Kershaw, it actually begins by talking about a day where witnesses saw what they believed at the time was dusting coming from the sky and falling on them. The thing was, when they touched it, it wasn't cold, and it was described as gray and white powder. Of course, the reality was that this was nuclear fallout blown from the test sites, and obviously this has had negative impacts on the people living on these sites, as they are at a higher risk for unlikely cancers due to the radioactive material that fell upon them. The Bora Earthquake On October 28, 1983, a 6.9 magnitude scale earthquake hit Utah at Bora Peak in central Idaho. This would result in damages more than $2.5 million. The loss of natural spring water. It also caused Mount Bora to rise by 6 inches and drop the valley from 5 to 9 feet. This earthquake would also have the unfortunate consequence of killing two people. 1996 Panhandle Floods Beginning on February 6th and lasting all the way until February 23rd, over 10 counties would be affected by severe flooding. These counties, Boundary, Bonner, Kootenai, Shoshone, Beniwa, Lata, Nez Perce, Lewis, Clearwater, and Idaho would see disaster level flooding. This was due to two things. Firstly, ice jams, and secondly, a rain on snow event. A rain on snow event is exactly what it sounds like. Basically, what happened before the flooding was some snow came down and over several days just before the flooding had actually warmed up and instead of snowing on more snow, four days of rain actually came and so it started the rain on the snow. But now it was starting to get very cold so you kind of ended up having like icy water on top of the rain. Most of the flooding would come from the Cordualine River which would see a peak crest of 51.62 feet. Another river that contributed to the flooding was the St. Joe River. In total, this flood would displace 30,000 people. Around 2,500 of those were in northern Idaho. In the end, this flood would cost $28,030,398 in damages to the state. 1948 Columbia River Flood, also known as the Vanport Flood. While a lot of the flooding and damage happened outside of Idaho, this flood did end up actually affecting Idaho. The river's headwaters would cause the tributaries of Montana, Idaho, British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon to start flooding over. More specifically, in Idaho, by May 23rd, the flooding on the Kurunai River would cause Bonner's Ferry and 25,000 acres of farmland to be flooded. The reason for this flood even starting was simply because of heavy rain and thunderstorms. In total, the Columbia River flood would cause $102.7 million in damages for the time. And the death toll isn't quite known, but it's assumed that 16 to 102 people died. Now the Columbia River flood has to be covered in other states such as Montana and Washington just because of how widespread this flood was, so I'll go more depth into it once we reach those states. 1959 Hebgen Lake Earthquake, also known as the 1959 Yellowstone Earthquake. On August 17th at 11.37pm in southwestern Montana, Basically on the border of Wyoming and Idaho, a 7.2 magnitude earthquake would occur lasting 30 to 40 seconds. This earthquake caused a landslide that moved 50 million cubic yards of rock and debris. 
and also caused the surrounding landscape to drop as much as 20 feet. It also caused 27 confirmed deaths in Montana and one unaccounted in Montana as well. Meanwhile, eight were reported in Idaho because of this earthquake. Those eight that died in Idaho died because of a landslide created by the earthquake. And lastly, the damage caused by this earthquake was roughly $11,1959, which is about $110.43 million in 2022 money. Tier 8 Raymond Snowden On September 22, 1956, a 34-year-old man named Raymond Snowden was going bar hopping and drinking heavily. Snowden had recently just gotten out of jail for pleading guilty to battery charges against his common-law wife. It was out while bar hopping. He would meet a woman, Cora Dean. The two would step out together, and while waiting for a taxi, they got into an argument about who would pay. They would both get physical. Cora Dean did this as she was trying to refuse Snowden's sexual advances. In response, he would pull out a penknife and slash her throat. Snowden would then mutilate her body, stabbing her at least 29 times. Snowden would then hail a motorist and go back to Boise, where he was staying at the Boise Hotel. He would change out of his clothes, throw away the weapon, and it wouldn't be until the next day on September 23rd when a boy riding his bicycle would discover Cora Dean's body. The very next day, the authorities would already be interrogating Snowden, and within eight hours, he would end up confessing to the crime. He would initially plead not guilty, but then eventually changed his mind and plead guilty. He would be charged with first-degree murder and be sentenced to execution. He would be executed via hanging on October 18, 1957. The Utter Van Ornum Massacre A wagon train consisting of 18 men, 5 women, 21 children, and 12 wagons would depart on May 1860. Everything would be fine until September 8th. They would reach Castle Creek, Idaho, and by that time there was only 8 wagons and 44 people left within the wagon train. Everything was fine up to that point. Assumedly the next day when things started going bad. For one, for whatever reason, as they were making their way westward, they would end up getting attacked by natives. Though they didn't do much, simply caused the wagon train to get in a defensive position and soon the natives would leave. But then shortly after, then again just one mile down the trail, they would be attacked again, this time by around 100 natives. It's not quite known which natives it were. It's assumed to be a mix of Shoshone and Bannock. This is when they started losing people and attacks would consistently happen. On September 10th, Another attack happened, but this time the party decided to abandon half of their wagons and all of their cattle in order to distract the natives so they could get away. That unfortunately did not end up working, and by the end of that plan, only 27 people would have survived. Basically after this, the party really had nothing, and they made a very pitiful small dugout in order to try to survive and wait for rescue. They would come across some natives who traded with them. They got some salmon, but unfortunately, they would lose their weapons as the natives ended up taking them. I guess not really trusting the settlers. Things were so bad, one settler actually willingly became a hostage with the natives in order to find more food and just get out of the situation they were in. It wouldn't be until October 24th, 45 days after the first attack, that an army relief expedition team would finally come and rescue the survivors. In the end, only 10 people would remain by the time the team got there. The Boys of Boise This all begins on October 31st, 1955 in Boise, after an investigation by a private detective would find three men responsible with immoral acts involving teenage boys. Two men would receive the charge of lewd conduct with a minor child, and one would get infamous crimes against nature. The thing about this though, was a prohibition officer would claim, with no evidence at all, that they had only just scratched the surface and that rather there was actually a ring of homosexual pedophiles within the town. With things like that being said by the prohibition officer, it would end up on the newspaper, causing a massive panic for all families in Boise. That probation officer would claim that at least a hundred underage boys had been involved in sexual activity with adult men. Because of this, around 1,500 men would be questioned, though in the end, only 16 men would see charges, and an article by Time Magazine brought a lot of shame to the town. There's a lot more in there, but again, that would need to be a deep dive, and I'm here just to give you a brief overview. The Ward Massacre 
On August 20, 1854, a six-wagon train party known as the Ward Party was on the Oregon Trail, making its way to Boise Valley, its destination, Fort Boise. Unfortunately for the party, while taking a short break, one of their horses would end up trying to be stole by a Shoshone Native American. In response to this, someone from the party would shoot the thief down. Shortly after, they would be ambushed by a mix of Snake and Shoshone Native Americans. The massacre would kill all but two people, two children to be exact. The two were brothers, and the only reason they survived was by feigning death. Both were actually shot with arrows going through them. The rest of the party that was still there were all killed, most thrown to a fire pit. The two brothers that survived, a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old, would have to crawl all their way to Fort Hall with an arrow through them. There were two other survivors, the kid's uncle and his wife, but they weren't with the party at the time of the attack, rather they were four miles ahead. This attack was known as the Ward Massacre, and the state of Idaho would make the Ward Memorial Park in honor to the 18 who died in this massacre. The Bear River Massacre Also known as the Battle of Bear River, or the Massacre of Baogai, it's when the government sent the United States Army to attack a Shoshone encampment near present-day Idaho on January 29, 1863. The reason for this attack was because the Shoshone finally decided to retaliate amongst all the settlers who were constantly taking their land and taking what little food was on it. But the attack by the army would leave 250 Shoshone killed, which included 90 women and children. The soldiers went through the village raping women and finishing off those who were dying to their injuries as well as burning 75 native lodges, taking 1,000 bushels of wheat and flour, and stealing 175 horses from the Shoshone. Though a very large number of them were killed, some managed to survive and get away. The Bear River Massacre isn't talked about a lot, mainly because it happened during the Civil War, and the war was seen as more important, so the Bear River Massacre didn't get much attention when it happened. Joseph Duncan III an American serial killer and child molester. Born on February 25, 1963 in North Carolina, he would die on March 28th in Indiana. Joseph Duncan III had a troubled upbringing and had a history of criminal behavior, including sexual offenses. One of his more notable offenses was being convicted of sexually assaulting a young boy in Washington State in 1980. He would be sentenced to 20 years in prison for this, but he was released on parole in 1994 after only serving 14 years. After being released, he lived in various places, including the Seattle area, where authorities believed he had killed two people and another in California, but both of the cases went cold. The cases would only be pinned to him after his most notable crimes. In May 2005, Duncan targeted the Grunet family in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It was on May 16th of that year. Authorities discovered the bodies of Brenda Grunet her boyfriend, Mark McKenzie, and her son, Slade Grune, in their home in Idaho. Brenda's two children were missing, Dylan and Shasta, and the authorities sent out an Amber Alert and also investigated the deaths as homicides. Duncan took Shasta and Dylan to a remote campsite in Montana, where he continued his spree of violence. He subjected the children to prolonged captivity, sexual abuse, and psychological torment. In July 2005, a waitress at a Denny's restaurant in Coeur d'Alene recognized Shasta and Dylan from news reports. She alerted the authorities, leading to Duncan's arrest and the rescue of Shasta. Unfortunately, Dylan did not survive the ordeal. In 2008, he pleaded guilty, and the jury recommended the death penalty. In 2009, Joseph Duncan III was sentenced to death for the kidnapping and murder of Dylan Grune. He received multiple life sentences for his other crimes. Duncan died in prison on March 28, 2021, while awaiting execution. Lida Keller Also known as Lida Trueblood or Flypaper Lida, the name she was born with was Lida Keller. She was an American woman who gained notoriety in the early 20th century for her involvement in multiple suspicious deaths, likely as a result of arsenic poisoning. Here's a brief overview of Lida's life and crime. Lida was born on October 16, 1882 in Catesville, Missouri. Lida married five to seven times, and tragically, four of her husbands died under mysterious circumstances. Lida married Robert Dooley on March 17, 1912. The couple settled with his brother, Ed Dooley, 
on a ranch in Twin Falls, Idaho, and had a daughter, Lorraine. Lorraine died unexpectedly in 1915, Lida claimed as a result of drinking water from a dirty well. Ed Dooley died soon after on August 1915. The cause was tomine poisoning. Robert Dooley soon after got ill and died of typhoid fever on October 12, 1915. She was left as the only survivor of the family. She collected the life insurance policies of each person shortly after each of their deaths. She had two other marriages, William G. McCaffle. They married on June 1917 and he died on October 1, 1918 in Montana. And then Harlan C. Lewis, whom she married on March 1919 and he died on July of that year, also in Montana. She then married for a fourth time in Pocatello, Idaho, the Edward F. Meyer in August 1920. He mysteriously fell sick of typhoid fever and he died on September 7, 1920. She was found by law enforcement in Honolulu, married for the fifth time to Navy Petty Officer Paul Southerd. Following extradition to Idaho, she was arraigned on July 11, 1921. She ended up being convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to 10 years of life in Idaho State Penitentiary. She managed to escape and then moved to Denver, Colorado. She became a housekeeper to Harry Whitlock, who she eventually married in March 1932. He eventually assisted in her arrest in Topeka, Kansas on July 31, 1932. Southern returned to the penitentiary in August 1932. She was released on probation in October 1941 and received a final pardon. Lida died of a heart attack on February 5, 1958 in Salt Lake City, Utah. The Lewis Clark Valley Murders The Lewis Clark Valley Murders refers to a series of unsolved murders and disappearances that occurred in the Lewis Clark Valley area which straddles the border between the states of Idaho and Washington. The cases involved several individuals who went missing or were murdered between the late 1970s and the early 1980s. Here are the individuals who were affected. Christina White, a 12-year-old girl, disappeared on April 28, 1979, while walking home from her friend's house after coming back from the Aston County Fair. She was last seen in Aston, Washington. Her remains were found in 1980 near the Snake River. Kristen David, a 22-year-old student from the University of Idaho disappeared on June 26, 1981, while traveling to Lewiston, Idaho from Moscow, Idaho. She was going south on the U.S. Highway 95. Her body was found on Snake River on July 4, 1981. The cause of her death remains undetermined. Numerous people traveling along Highway 95 on the day of David's disappearance reported witnessing a woman resembling David being approached by a man in a brown vehicle near Genesee, Idaho on the west or southbound side of the road. Additional eyewitnesses stated that the same man interacted with multiple female cyclists and pedestrians along Highway 95 on that particular day. Christina Deanne Nelson, who was 21, and Jacqueline Ann Miller, who was 18, would disappear while walking from Nelson's apartment to a grocery store in downtown Lewiston, Idaho, on September 12, 1982. The same night, Stephen R. Purcell, who was 35, also went missing from the Lewiston Civic Theater. He asked his friends to drop him off so he could do some laundry washing and clarinet practice. Purcell knew both women and had a big brother-like relationship with them. The discovery of Nelson and Miller's remains occurred on March 19, 1984, in a rural area approximately 35 miles from Lewiston, near Kendrick, Idaho. Although investigators were unable to determine the cause of death for Nelson, they concluded that Miller had been murdered. Police received reports of a man and two girls hitchhiking outside of Lewiston but nothing materialized to help the investigation progress. Purcell, the third individual associated with the case, was never found. Initially, investigators suspected Purcell's involvement in the abduction and murders of Nielsen and Miller, but later shifted their theory, suggesting that all three individuals were likely present in or around the theater at the time of their disappearance, falling prey to the same unidentified killer. Authorities think the possibility that Purcell may have witnessed the murders and met the same fate himself. We don't really know if all the cases are actually connected. In 1984, Idaho State Police announced that Otis Toole, an American serial killer, had incriminated himself in the murder of Kristen David and was a suspect. But two other men had also confessed to the crime. And in the 2011 documentary, Confluence, indicated that Lance Jeffrey Voss was an unnamed suspect in the case. In 2018, Investigation Discovery released Cold Valley, a two-part documentary series examining the case. The series connected three additional cases from outside of the state, including one from 1963. On August 3, 1963, the body of eight-year-old Diane Taylor was discovered behind an alley in the Austin community of Chicago, Illinois. 
Diane had been stabbed in the heart and had numerous lacerations on her body. Authorities believe she was murdered at another location and dumped in the alley. The autopsy report indicated that she was killed approximately 36 hours before her body was found. Although that case is really from Idaho, so I'm just mentioning it in passing. The murder of Regina Krieger. A tragic case that occurred on February 28, 1995 in Cassia County, Idaho. Regina Krieger, a 14-year-old girl, was found dead in her home. Her murder was one of Idaho's most notorious cold cases for 24 years till it was solved in 2019. On February 28th, Cassia County Sheriff's Office received a report of Regina being missing. The detectives arrived and discovered blood on the bathroom floor leading up to the stairs of the Krieger's home backyard. The blood trail suggested that something had been dragged up the stairs. During questioning, Dan, her father, mentioned that he had last seen his daughter before she went to bed. Suspecting foul play, the officers initiated a search for Regina, but she remained missing for more than a month. On April 15, 1995, a party of horseback riders located her severely decomposed body along the banks of the Snake River. Not far downstream from the Minidoka Dam, in February 2019, Cassia County Sheriff's Office announced that they charged Gilberto Flores Rodriguez in the murder of Regina. At the time it was announced, the arrest was made following the testimony of three witnesses who came up linking the then 56-year-old to the brutal murder of the teen. Gilberto went on trial in April 2019. A jury convicted Gilberto of first-degree murder in June 2021, and he was sentenced to life in prison. As per official records, the six-year-old is serving his sentence at the Idaho State Correctional Institution Unit 11. The Disappearance of Dior Kunz Jr. This is a mysterious case that occurred on July 10, 2015. During a camping trip near Lettor, Idaho, Dior Kunz Jr. was a two-year-old boy who vanished without a trace while on a family outing in Timber Creek Campground. Dior was with his parents, his great-grandfather, and a family friend during the camping trip. The group reported the child missing, sparking an extensive search operation that involved law enforcement agencies and volunteers. Despite thorough efforts, no sign of Dior was found in the surrounding areas. The case has been marked by conflicting statements and theories from adults present during the camping trip. The family members have given different accounts of the events leading up to Dior's disappearance, contributing to the mystery. Some theories suggest abduction, while others speculate on the possibility of an accident. The topic is a whole rabbit hole itself, and to truly explain what it is, a whole separate video would be needed. The Murder of Angie Dodge This is a case that involves a tragic killing of the 18-year-old Angie Dodge in her apartment in Idaho Falls. On January 13, 1996, Angie was sexually assaulted and brutally murdered, and her body was discovered by two co-workers who were concerned that Angie had not come into work that morning. The case remained unsolved for several years, and its complexity led to a wrongful conviction before the real perpetrator was identified. Initially, Christopher Tapp was convicted of the crime based on a confession he later claimed was coerced. Christopher Tapp was convicted and imprisoned for 20 years till they found the true murderer. However, DNA evidence later indicated that Tapp was not the sole perpetrator, and the investigation continued to find the true assailant. In 2019, after advancements in forensic technology, the DNA evidence collected from the crime scene was reanalyzed. This led to the arrest of Brian Drips, who ultimately confessed to the murder of Angie Dodge. Brian Drips' DNA matched the evidence found at the crime scene, providing a crucial breakthrough in the case. If you made it this far into the video, thank you for making it all the way, watching it till the end. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're from Idaho, I hope you enjoyed the entries and thought it was a good iceberg. If I missed anything, make sure to let me know down in the comments. And that's basically it. Uh, I hope you have a good day and uh, see ya.